Hello everyone and welcome to the series of videos that I have decided to put together to help with something I've seen significantly lacking in Unreal Engine projects, at least done by small solo developers like myself and they do not deal with some things that really really should be dealt with that will make things much easier. So for the goals for these videos is to basically talk about an end-to-end -end project setup with Unreal Engine 5.3 with automation. And this is for basically working on a project by yourself. So we're going to start talking about, we're going to start with going from your concepts, which is basically what you want to actually build. Go on to design and architecture, on to implementation, which is where probably the bulk of your time is going to be, to distribution of your game, and finally to get the feedback from your customers and how do you handle that. And then that all goes back towards the concepts that you had started the project with. So this is an entire loop of development where you go from concept all the way to feedback and then feedback into your concepts and keep on working your way through as you develop your game. Now this can be seen as a waterfall method or an agile method. It's basically the same sort of thing. So when we're going to be talking about our concepts, we're going to be using Azure DevOps issues. That is going to be our database and our interface to record all of our issues. For design and architecture, we can use any type of design tools, anything from a UML tool to Office to Wiki. I'm not going to, going to cover that today in these videos. Uh, then we have implementation, and that's usually done through IDE or your digital content creation uh, tools. So things like Visual Studio 2022, the UE editor, Blender, or whatever. And then distribution, we're going to be using Jenkins to do the final build and the final cooking of our assets. And then all these things are going to hook into Azure DevOps repos. So that is where these pieces are going to hook into so that we have a tool to coordinate all of this. And of course, feedback will go back into Observe DevOps issues. All right, so let's talk about game development, discipline, and DevOps. So what is development discipline? So basically, it's a set of policies that you set up as a way to help you with, to help maintain your focus, which is, if you're anything like me, you have the focus of, let's just say, an insane goldfish. <laughs> who has a hard time focusing on the various different tasks. With a good development discipline, you'll be able to help with maintain your focus. It will help to organize your project. It'll also help you to decompose your project. Now, this is a very important part of getting your project off the floor, and I'll probably be talking about this more in depth later. It also helps to keep your project secure. Okay, and what I mean by secure is not that it's unhackable or anything like that. I'm talking about that you are secure in the knowledge that it will be there for you. So what is DevOps? DevOps is an implementation of your development discipline. It's often its own department in a company, but since we're solo developers, we're going to have to work on that ourselves. All right. It's a process of going from your concept to your customers and users and to new concepts based on your customer feedback. Hopefully most of this process is automated. It may not be, but hopefully you'll be able to automate most of it. If it's done right, it also removes the stress so that you can focus on your game development. And what I mean by how it removes stress is through project decomposition and for making sure that your project is always secure and able to be used. What is our goal when we're using DevOps as an indie or solo developer? We want to organize our process using issue tracking. We want to automatically build our game using continuous integration. We want to gather feedback and bugs using issue tracking. And we want to supplement our lousy memories. I am a terrible at having a good memory, and this process or these DevOps uh, operations or whatever you want to call them will help to get that memory a little bit more firm. 
and we also want to be able to recover from disasters. This can be anything like somebody breaking into your home and stealing your development machines, from a flood coming in the door and uh, flooding out your development machines, an earthquake, or whatever. Let's talk about versioning of your game. It's going to be a very important part of how you release your game. I use something called Semantic Versioning, or Semver. It has its own webpage at semver.org. It's a way of versioning the game so that you can keep track of things. Think of it as a way to help organize your milestones and how to help send it out to your customers in such a way that they have more confidence in what they will see and expect. For me in my game, I'll be using the major number as a complete increment of the game. So basically it will be a complete game that I'm happy to sell on Steam or good old games or wherever. And it is going to be basically represent the first public version of the game that is not what I would call a test candidate or a release candidate. It's basically, it's being debugged and it's feature complete. Minor numbers, which is the next number over, these are milestones that work to the next major number. So we will start at major number zero, go to major number one, major number two. When I plan out my project, I'm going to be basically planning out based on the minor numbers. And when I f feel like I am complete, then I will move over to the major number. 0.1.0 would represent maybe the first playable game. It'd be the first thing to demonstrate out the technologies I want to build. 0.2.0 would probably be the prologue of the game. 0.3.0 would be the first chapter. So we just keep on incrementing that. And since we do not have a leading zero in these numbers, which is actually against Semver, I could go up to some like version 0.156 if I wanted to. But I probably won't get that far with the numbering before I go over to the major version. The next one is the patch number. Okay. So what this is used for is to indicate that you are fixing bugs in your game for that version. So 1.0.1 would be fixes to 1.0.0. Now this probably should not, actually it definitely should not include any new features. This dot one version of the release. You, if you want to add in new features, it would be 1.1 or 1.2. So the next part is the more, a little bit more of what we can add to Semverge. There's a pre-release tag. Uh, this determines what type of build it is. So I'm going to be using the following terms in my game. Prod, so it's an in-production weekly build, and they may not be ready for testing. Alpha, feature complete and it's ready for testing. Beta, it's a final alpha build. All show stopping bugs have been completed and basically all the other, all the rest of the bugs that are left that have been reported are not considered major and fixing them would not allow us to get out the door in a timely fashion. So beta is basically pretty close to the end of the development cycle. When I was working at Electronic Arts, our beta had to be tested for 500 hours by the testers before we could declare it as final. Our alpha, or the previous build, had to be tested for 300 hours before beta. And that version, basically what happens is that if we want to go from alpha to beta, we had to have 300 hours of testing without any major show-stopping bugs. If we did hit a major show-stopping bug, we'd have to reset that clock and then test for another 300 hours. To go from beta to final, it was 500 hours. This was when I was working at Electronic Cars, and this helped us to keep down the number of show-stopping bugs that went out the door. We have a release candidate, RC. It may be the same as the beta, but basically, it's what I would feel is ready to go out the door as the final version. But I just want to do a little bit more testing just to make sure. So an example of this would be 0.1.0-prod. So this would be a production build for 0.1.0. And then there is the build metadata as defined by Semver. So what I'm going to be using this for is for tagging by the continuous integration server. 
when the continuous integration server makes a build, it will have a build number on it. And this is what I'm going to have added to the end of the version number. Example of this here is 0.1.0-prod plus 1234. So that would be the 1234th build of the 0 0.1.0 build. Okay, for my development environment, this is what I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using the Unreal Engine 5.3. I'm going to be using Visual Studio 2022. For the revision control system, as I've already said, I'm going to be using Git, or basically Git backed by Azure DevOps repos. And for issue tracking, I will be using the Azure, Azure DevOps boards. Okay, those all come with Azure DevOps. And for continuous integration, I'll be using Jenkins. So let's talk about revision control quickly. A lot of people who are doing solo or indie game developments have never heard of revision control. So let's just talk about it quickly. So what is it? It's a way of storing different versions of your data. So that could be your source code, that could be your assets, that could be anything. If you make a mistake, you can return to a previous version based off of when you have your version in there. Or you can use it to compare previous versions. So this is allows you to return, uh, recover from disasters of your own making. So why use it? As I said, you will make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. And that will be what's going to be going on in there. So you're going to be making mistakes. You can use your vision control system to go back. It helps you organize things. Organization is key to anything. You can store the data off-site to help with disasters. And that is very important, and this helps you to reduce stress in your project. So why am I going to be using Azure DevOps for my project? Basically, the project I'm working on is unfunded, it's an indie, and it's a solo project. Okay, I have no support. Azure DevOps is free for up to five users. So, it's free. Most of the data in a game is going to be binary assets. So that includes things like your visual art, your audio art, your blueprint, your assets, whatever. Any type of binary asset in the art is going to be at least 95% of the actual size of your game, whereas your code is going to be such a small portion of it. If we want to talk about an extremely large project with source code, you may have 30 megs of source code. If you have that much source code, well, good, good on you. But for an, an indie project, I don't think you'll ever get to that much source code. But you think about it, 30 megs of source code, that's enormous. 30 megs of visual art, a couple of pictures maybe. <laughs> you may have got a, couple, a little bit of a animation in there. Audio, oh, what, what does that work out to? Maybe about 30 seconds of audio in there and you were already past 30 megs. So yeah most of your data is going to be binary assets. Git has add-on called Git LFS. Now this is how it handles large amounts of binary data. LFS stands for large file system. Git is wonderful when dealing with source code. That's how it was designed. It is absolutely wonderful for source code, but when it comes to binary assets, it kind of doesn't work in its, in, in its default configuration. What happens basically is because Git is a distributed revision control system, the entire revision control database is on everybody's machine. And if you're talking about binary data on everybody's machine, you are talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of megabytes on everybody's machine that isn't going to be used or looked at. So. Git LFS was created to help with that problem. But for small projects, Git LFS works okay for binary data. When you're talking about large projects, unfortunately, if you get into a large project with funding, Perforce is the industry standard when it comes to revision control. Unfortunately, Perforce is very much a Cadillac of the industry you need to have somebody specialized to maintain your revision control system and your users have to know how to use it. It's a very nice system, but it does take a lot of effort to get it to work and run nicely, uh, especially when we're talking about a large project. 
because you can have terabytes and terabytes of data and your DevOps personnel will have to deal with keeping that maintained back up, make sure that the, the machine that it's housed on is not crashing, you know, things like that. So it becomes more and more of a specialized things. Now, Perforce can be used for small projects. You can use it for um, team uh, for up to 20, uh, 20 projects and I think five users uh, for free. Okay, that's just to use the software. The problem with that is that that doesn't include the server. Okay, and you're talking about having a server running someplace that has the Perforce server that you have to maintain and make sure it's you pay for and all that sort of stuff. So that that Perforce, as I said, is a good revision control system for game development. It's better than Git actually, but there are costs hidden uh, behind it that you will have to maintain as an indie developer and you should really not have to worry about that. You should be focusing on your game instead of maintaining your back end. So the other thing is Observe DevOps has unlimited storage on unlimited transfers for Git LFS. And that is very important when it comes to games. As I said, 95 to 99% of your game is going to be binary assets and that means it's going to be going through Git LFS. So there's also GitHub out there, but it limits you to 50 gigabytes of storage per account or one gigabyte. It's kind of confusing on their website for what it is. But after you go past 50, 50 gigabytes, you have to actually spend another $5 to get another 50 gigabytes and so forth as you go along. So it's, it's $5 a month. There's not much point in doing that with a game that's going to have probably 50 gigabytes easily when you go through the entire uh, development of it. SourceForge is another one. It's actually backed by SVN. They prefer you have your projects to be most five gigabytes at, at most, but you can get up to 20 to 30 if you like. It doesn't use Git LFS, it's SVN. But again, when we're talking about a game, you're going to be going past that limit fairly easily. There's GitLab, it gives you 10, gigabyte, 10 gigabytes for free. Again, not enough. And there's Bitbucket Cloud, again, well, not enough. So this is why we're looking at Observe DevOps for running the games back in for the, for the revision control. And as I said, it also comes with issue tracking, but so does GitHub and GitLab. So that's not really that big of a deal. It's just nice to have it hooked up with the revision control system. The other thing is everything is stored offsite so that when disaster happens, you won't lose your work. You just have to remember to keep on, uh, keep your, your development discipline and you'll be able to have a successful project by using these tools if you keep at it. You don't have to worry about, the thing that, that I'm trying to get at here is that you don't have to worry that your data will get lost or that your if your machines get stolen, whatever, and you don't lose years of work and years of effort on that part, you have the assurance that it will be there and ready for you when you're able to get back to it. Well, that wraps up the introduction I want to give, uh, but next time in the next video, I hope to get to setting up Azure DevOps and basically getting the repo set up and getting the initial Git LFS and uh, Git Ignore done and in place. But if you want to catch me on stream, I stream on Twitch under Air Deacon Games. But until then, you guys have fun with Unreal and DevOps and hope to catch you guys later.